incredibly excited to reopen. We actually opened a little later than we were, you know, quote, allowed to open um, because our, we were a historic house museum and we, we don't operate like a regular museum. There's no way to put like a sheet of plexi in front of our front desk. So with that in mind, I think we had to have really careful conversations about how we were going to manage this very complicated process. We opened about a month after sort of the state of Illinois said we could reopen. And we watched a lot of our colleagues and what they did and what worked well and what worked badly. And so we sort of took best practices from our colleagues and friends and implemented them that way. And we also made a really conscious decision to do less, not more. As soon as the state started to move towards reopening, we were on it. We had one of the first to order temperature machines. We were one of the first to work with our vendors for plexiglass. We were in the museum envisioning a one-way traffic flow. We were creating signage. We were building our web page. We were building our email. And we were working on that probably a good four to six weeks, even before our July 15th reopening. At present, all visitors over the age of two and all CHM staff have to wear masks at all time um, when they're in the museum spaces, even in the offices for staff. And that is again because you know safety is has to be uh, paramount uh, at this time. There are now hand sanitizing stations throughout the entire museum, all over the place places you wouldn't even think of, they are there because you never know when you're going to need it. For those touchables that are still in our exhibitions, you know, screens and so forth, visitors now have access to uh, use styluses that they can get from the check-in desk as well um, to still help them be able to engage, but doing so without having to use their hands. We're at 25 capacity like everyone else under state mandate, and we've actually set our numbers even lower with the recent passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and our current temporary exhibition, RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We've seen many, many visitors in our museum with the intention of seeing this exhibition because of that and the, the kind of preponderance of the volume that is in that exhibition, we've set our capacity even lower than allowed by the state. We've taken some of the diehard programs that CHM has done in the past, like our tour program, um, conversation series, and we've turned all of those virtual. You know, as the time progressed and as we kind of wrapped our arms around what we needed to be doing, we develop more and more virtual content. And now if you visit our website, you'll see programs, you can see exhibitions, you can see our artifacts and it's all there. All of our virtual programming has been met enthusiastically. And we've actually really seen that it's expanded our reach and impact. We have virtual programs that are attended from close to a thousand people. We also understand that even when we can do more programming, I think we're, we're sort of committed to the fact that we will for a long time have some virtual component because there are gonna be people who even when we're all told, you know, go here, go there, it's fine. I think we're gonna have people who don't want to do that and we don't wanna lose those people either. Those are good friends and supporters of ours also. You know, we have a lot to consider and I for one am all for continuing to offer these types of engagement. We've also been able to not only reach new audiences, but share new stories through um, these platforms as well. So, you know, the, the stories that CHM has presented in the tour format uh, related to Chicago history, we've been able to add Add to those new neighborhoods, new histories, new tour guides. And the benefit, of course, is that people don't have to leave their, their home, um, whether they are participating or presenting, everyone is able to, to connect instantly. Mm -hmm.